Professor Winston Sweet, founder of the Distinguished Lecture Series, Dr. Amarna Chukchami, Program Leader of the Project Management and Civil Infrastructure Systems, Mr. Vaughan Lazama, Registrar of the Board of Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, and also our Vice Chairman of the PMCIS Industrial Liaison Board, Advisory Board. Specially invited guests and all other attendees, good evening. My name is Kavita Ramrain Ramsawa, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. It is with great pleasure that I invite each one of you and warmly welcome, sorry, welcome each one of you to our distinguished lecture today. The lecture is entitled, Issues Impacting Congestion Reduction in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is held by our esteemed Dr. Trevor Townsend. Ironically, we had a delay in our start today because of this timely topic, right? So we did not help that. Um, these lectures are in alignment with UTT's mission, which states to contribute to the sustainable and entrepreneurial development of society through the advancement and application of research, dissemination of knowledge, and public engagement in our pursuit to produce work-ready graduates, innovators, and critical thinkers. So I'm encouraging each one of you to engage in the discussion after today's presentation. We all have diverse backgrounds and different perspectives, so let us share with one another so we can all learn and grow intellectually. So on this note, I'd like to invite Dr. Amarnath Chinchami to the lectern to introduce our speaker for today. It's my indeed a pleasure to welcome Dr. Trevor Townsend to UTT and also to deliver his um, lecture. Dr. Townsend is a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a BSc in Civil Engineering, first class honors. He's also a graduate of the University of Manitoba with an MSc in Civil Engineering majoring in transportation engineering, and also a graduate of the Northwestern University with his PhD in transportation system engineering. He's a fellow of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transport, and also a fellow of the Association of the Professional Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, APET, and a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers. He's a registered engineer with Boet and a chartered engineer in the UK. Dr. Thompson has worked both in public and private sectors during his career in the area of traffic and transportation engineering, public transportation and public policy with regards to infrastructure development. He has been engaged in the private consultants on a number of transportation policies, transportation, planning, and traffic impact assessment studies. Dr. Stonson started his career in public service and held the post of chief traffic engineer, traffic, manage, traffic management branch, Ministry of Works and Transportation. He went on to the Public Transportation Service Corporation as a general manager from 1988 to 1998. During the period 1998 to 2014, he worked in the manufacturing sector as a chief executive officer, dealing with the, challenging, the challenges of sustainable, sustaining small and medium-sized manufacturing companies in today's competitive global environment. In 2014, Dr. Thompson joined the staff of the University of the West Indies as a senior lecturer in tra traffic and transportation engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental, Civil and Environmental Engineering. He, is a, he has recently retired as the head of department and is now an advisor 
on the transportation engineering projects to the Engineering Institute, Faculty of Engineering U. Dr. Thompson has served as a member or as a board member of NIPDEC and NITCO. He has also been a member of the board of the TTMA from 2005 to 2012 and served as the chairman of the Port Transportation and Logistics Committee. Dr. Thompson currently is the president of the Association of Professional Engineers, APET. Please, ladies and gentlemen, viewers and guests here, welcome Dr. Trevor Thompson. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Professor. Um, <laughs> I was telling um, to Peter that I am so old that if I take your half out, one of the things I've done. Um, it is indeed a pleasure that I have finally arrived. And this is indeed, I, I have to apologize to those um, long suffering persons who thought of you were going to start at five, as I did. And um, you ended up starting at six. And it is interesting that. The topic we're going to be covering today is issues impacting congestion reduction, because we have had a conference of incidents, not unusual, unfortunately, but nevertheless devastating to a significant Sorry. part of the country. Because I took three hours to get from Diego Martin to here. And I can only empathize with those who are going to be taking five hours to get from where they work to where they live this afternoon. And we can talk about a whole number of things which would have caused that. But I would want to argue that what causes, and, that, and by the way, this is not the first time I'm sure we, have, we all, all have had experiences. I remember in one case I was supposed to carry my son to the airport. And I gave, we gave ourselves a four hour window. And he, by the time he arrived, the plane was closing the door. And we had to beg them to take him on. And he was going to London. So you can imagine if you missed that flight. But you see, that is where we are. And what I want to be touching on this evening is, is to talk a little bit about how we move from where we are. And I will also be touching on how we got to where we are as well. Okay. So that um, the objectives are, of, of today's talk are very straightforward. Um, I want to go to, I'm going to identify the key issues. I'll to share my screen, I've been told. But I will not be stingy. <laughs> Let me. Let me work that out. Don't worry. The screen. This one, the screen shall I share? I shall share this one here. That's right. Nope. Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Get this picture off. Try again. Yeah, so let me share. There you go. And that's why we need young people to really help. There you go. <laughs> so let's talk about the issues impacting congestion reduction. And this talk, actually, I mean, it's some paper that, and a presentation that was made by the UE team to the Joint Select Committee on this matter in 2019. And this was an interesting joint senior committee of parliament because there were members of the government, opposition, and I think some independent senators as well were on this committee. So that the point I want to make is that the information I'm sharing here is in the hands of. It is known to all those who are in authority and those who are in opposition to authority, if I want to call it that way. And we will judge whether or not over the last four years, there has been any significant action or even any significant discussion at the highest level of the country about these issues. 
We can judge that for ourselves. So, moving on. Once I get my presentation to work. If it doesn't work this way, I will look at it next. So, what's the objective? I want to identify the key issues which are leading to persistent and growing traffic congestion. I want to talk about short, medium, and long-term strategies that are going to be necessary to address these problems and to essentially enhance the mobility and improve the functioning of our transportation system. So let's talk about the sector, the characteristics of the transport sector. I had a debate with one of my colleagues because my slide was entitled Transportation System Characteristics. But at the end of the characteristics, I say we don't have a system. So I was challenged, and he's a mathematician, so he challenged my logic. He said, how can you speak about system characteristics and you don't have a system? So I'm just going to talk about the sector characteristics. We do have a well-developed highway system linking east-west and north-south communities. In fact, I, I came from Port of Spain to here, and I did not encounter a single traffic signal. It still took me three hours. So that those who believe that moving traffic signals is a way to solve congestion didn't go to the schools I went to. That's what I was. <laughs> I'll come back to that later. We have very high per capita vehicle ownership. And this figure is probably underestimated. I, I use this figure 500 vehicles, uh, basically uh, one car for every two persons, essentially almost. Um, I will not debate this part position because you see there may be some unregistered vehicles or some vehicles that should be unregistered, but until the transport commissioner is able to tell us specifically that number, we go with that, that comes from World Bank information. Now, interestingly, we have public transport operators. We have 95% actually, and I want to bear this in mind, 95% of public transportation is done by privately owned public transport operators. Either the sedan taxis or the maxi taxis. And then, of course, in addition to them, as if we needed any other help, we have the illegal, unauthorized, unlicensed PH taxis that initially started operating on rural routes and at unsociable hours, but have no one on the almost, they're very ubiquitous. And they, in fact, have affected the livelihood of the legitimate taxi operators. In fact, I question whether or not we actually have those 25,000 legal taxis that are actually operating, because many of them have said that there is no benefit to them of going through the cost and other issues of being a legal taxi operator, when people can operate their PHs at will without having to go through what they have to go through. And that is something we can discuss if you have time. As I said, certain traffic regulations seem to encourage this. We have a state-owned bus company, PTSE, which ostensibly operates 300 medium and full-size and articulated buses on a daily basis. We have a, a, a bit of infrastructure, the priority bus route, which at one time was the longest priority bus route in the world. And in fact, we were ahead of most of the world in terms of creating a priority for public transport vehicles. we we'll talk a little later about what has happened to that. And we have, these are my words, oh, I forgot to say that any, any views expressed at today's lectures are the views of the lecturer. <laughs> they are not the views, I, I will not speak for Yui. <laughs> I will not speak for Abed. I will speak for me. So that um, please don't hold what I say against UV and or against that. But I would say that we have one of the most luxurious and most heavily subsidized, lowest volumes luxury water taxi systems in the world, linking north to south. When I raise that point with certain people in these various levels of the state sector, I'm not talking about governmental ministers. They, they take umbrage because they use it and they understand the value proposition that they are receiving. But I'm wondering what is the value proposition to the country for what these people are receiving? But we can talk about that as well. 
um, the, in terms of public operations, and here we're going to be talking about it right now. The PTSC carries out 11 million passengers per year, and they have an operating subsidy of $300 million plus. You can do some quick math and work out what is that in terms of subsidy per passenger. We have the water taxi carrying a half a million passengers a year, and their operating subsidy is $53 million. Again, do some quick division and understand that each water taxi passenger is subsidized by the taxpayers of this country to the tune of over $100 per trip. Think about that every time you have to pay taxes. And then you have the private operators, the maxi taxis and the taxis, and they actually carry 200, look at the difference, 95%, 275 million passenger trips per year. They are practically unsubsidized, other than whatever general subsidies are given to all drivers. The assets that I invested there is over $4.5 billion. And the jobs invested in that industry is $14,000. And I'm going to make that as a point because we seem to not recognize in this country that this is a major sector which requires planning, management, and organization, as well as investment. So that we have no coordination not much published schedules, and certainly not to meet maxi taxi in the taxi industry, and no information about rates. So if you were a driver and wanted to change your mode, you will have to look high and low and ask around to try to figure out how to get from your point E to point B, other than using your car. And in fact, when we did a study at the UE back in 2019, and we asked that specific question of some drivers, if you did not have your car, what mode would you use? Many of them basically said that they could not think about what they would use. They could not imagine because they had no information and they did not know where to get information about taking alternative modes. They said many other things, but I will, I will perhaps, if I have enough time, we will be going to that. So that this is just some pictures that people like to show that show that we are well-developed highway system. Um, this is part of CityGate. Um, and this is a typical taxi stand showing the facilities available for taxi operators and their passengers. If you don't see any facilities, that's the answer. And then this is typically what happens now in Port of Spain at taxi stands. Note the license plate of the vehicle that they seem to be operating Next to the taxi, the taxi is a white vehicle. That's the effect of pH on the livelihood of legitimate taxi operators who choose to obey the law and get their age rights, get a police certificate of character, have their vehicles inspected every year, and pay higher insurance premiums. Okay, don't we'll get me started. I have lots more to talk about. So we know that we have a transportation sector in crisis. <laughs> During peak period, and I, I guess three o'clock is a peak period because the highways and urban arterials are congested. Car ownership levels are high and occupancy levels are low. Um, I remember we did a study at UV for of, of vehicle occupancy on the um, Chisholm Highway, 1.3 persons per vehicle. 1.3 persons per vehicle. Our public transport systems are undermanaged, disorganized, and certainly not user friendly, with all due respect. Parking in major urban areas is inadequate in terms of off street parking and totally uncontrolled. And the worst places in terms of illegal parking is outside police administration buildings and police stations. You can come to your own conclusions as to why. And then in our major urban centers, pedestrians and persons with disabilities are left to fend for themselves. We had a bright idea that said that we're going to take off all the traffic signals in Port of Spain. That was obviously a decision of somebody who doesn't have to walk and try to cross the streets of Port of Spain. Because now you have no pedestrian signal, you have no indication as to when the pedestrians are safe to cross. And if anybody ever observed who are the pedestrians in Port of Spain, many of them are school children. And then, of course, there are pedestrians who have disabilities of sight and sound and, and, and physical so, problems in that. So, what is congestion? 
And I'm still, you will be with me if I go a little bit of technical. This, this is not going to be a very technical discussion. Um, I, I'm not going to put any, I'm going to put one equation on, you know, just to, just to make the engineers happy. But it's, I'm not going to put any symbols. I try not to. But basically, congestion occurs based symbols. The rate of arrival for, for, of, for service is, is higher than the rate at which service can be given. So that a queue will form at the service point and, and the resultant congestion means that your demand or arrival rate is higher than your service rate. Your demand is higher than your capacity to service that demand. So I wanted to bear that in mind um, as you go along. So that's basically a disequilibrium between demand and supply. Now in the transport system, now in, in private business, if you have too many people coming to watch a show or coming to, to engage in something or to buy something, what happens? Prices change and the market balances. And so what, a normal sign of the fact that prices need to change is congestion. But in the transport system, people cannot buy their way out of the traffic congestion. And therefore, maybe today's a good day. Ask me how much I would have paid to come here on time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how much would I have paid? And, and, and that is reality, but in the transport system, we can't. And therefore, what the, what the economists would say is a, a loss of consumer surplus because of the fact that congestion exists. So in fact, every time we have congestion, the nation loses. In time, in fuel in greenhouse gas emissions, in productivity, in all aspects, we are losing, losing, losing. And of course, there are other negative externalities because these things won't just affect the persons who are in the congested arrangement, right? So that's, that's a challenge. So here's my equation. I, I decided I had to put up this fundamental dialogue of traffic <laughs> And, 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 and therefore, my equation is only in words. Sorry, um, Dr. So Fuller. Flow is density by space means speed. Now, that, if, you have, if you have done any traffic engineering, that is the fundamental equation of traffic flow. And those three diagrams are considered to be the fundamental diagrams of traffic flow. And this, I'm just going to explain a little bit about them. Though if you're not a, 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 a traffic engineer, don't panic. It's, it's very straightforward. Essentially, here's what happens. When you have a facility that has no body wanting to use it, you can have maximum flow at, at, at maximum speed that is allowed on that facility. As your number of, by the way, let me just give some definitions. Flow, sorry, my vehicle, I was really trying to show it. Flow is the number of vehicles that you measure passing a particular point in time. So if you imagine standing at a point and you're measuring vehicles that are passing, one, two, three, four, that's the flow. So it's so many vehicles per hour normally is computed, you know? Density is the number of vehicles that occupy a unit space in an instant. So if I took a picture of the, of the kilometer, the last kilometer before I reached here, it will show a density of X hundred vehicles in that kilometer. And speed, of course, is the speed at which that volume of vehicles, is not an individual vehicle, but a platoon of vehicles is moving. And this is the fundamental relationship between flow, density, and speed. Now, why do I talk about that? Because people who don't understand traffic engineer don't talk about density at all. They talk about flow, they talk about speed. But they seem not to understand that density is the most critical thing. Because density actually determines flow and speed. <laughs> so as you increase your densities, and of course, you increase your flows because more vehicles are passing. What happens, and the top graph shows it, is that you reach a point of maximum capacity of that facility. And if I can use my pointer, oh my goodness, I should not have done that. Okay, <laughs> sensitive entry. So that's at the top of that graph there. Now, here's what happens. If you continue to increase your density by putting more vehicles into that length of highway, your actual flow declines from your capacity. In reality, what you are doing actually, you are lowering the capacity of that roadway. 
And I, I liken it to having the trying to empty Chana from a bottle. I put it on one time and it gets stuck all there because they interfere with each other as opposed to letting it flow. So when you're hungry, you want the channel fast. No, <laughs> let it flow. <laughs> Don't ever exceed the capacity for it to flow. Because when you exceed the capacity, your situation is worsened. So when you decide that you are going to free up, quote unquote, flow of vehicles into Port of Spain, but you have a capacity constraint in Port of Spain known as the lighthouse, what you are actually doing is that you're increasing the density of the roadway adjacent to the lighthouse, and you are in fact lowering the entire capacity of your system. And of course, when you get past the lighthouse, then you have another capacity constraint, as my colleague Ray says, ability to find a free park in Port of Spain, which is anybody who they want to have. Anyway, let's not get into that. So the, the point I want to make, therefore, is that it is in it makes no sense to load up your facilities beyond the capacity of your system. Because once you get into congested flow, your capacity declines and your system is worse off, right? So those who want to move all the traffic lights and expect not to have today what happened today, have to understand what that means. There are so many examples that show that the wider the road is, the more the congested is. I don't understand why we don't learn from people what people have done already. But maybe you'll we'll learn that after we see what happened at the Young Road, but that's another story. I'm going to move on. As I said, the views expressed today are the views of the left, <laughs> not the views of any organization. But the point of the matter is that, really and truly, I, I, I say it, and if you don't laugh, you'll cry. But the fact of the matter is that we do not have proper traffic engineering taking place in this country. We don't. I would challenge anybody to tell me that we do, because I have many questions to ask whoever says that that has happened in terms of some of the stuff we do. Um, let me continue, as I will get stuck on that. So, come back to the disequilibrium issue. And there are really three types of disequilibrium. I, I just kind of create that, those boundaries just to understand that maybe the, the, what we are looking at may be different in one case. Here. Short term, um, accident, for instance, but I computer said that we had three accidents going down south and one going east. And then we had rain. But I don't know what I don't know what happens to the rain, but let's just say we had three accidents, and those were considered to be short-term uh, congestion. Of course, you see how short-term congestion could lead to all sorts of things. Eh? Short-term is a relative term. I mean, I mean that if what has caused the congestion, I don't, I don't mean that the congestion is for a short time. Short maybe in terms of hours as opposed to days and weeks. So short term is really caused by a specific event or incident that has normally reduced the capacity. Normally a short term incident is what is, called, is causing a reduction in capacity or a short increase in demand. Like sometimes when people are trying to come out of after they haven't done a whole night party in down on the party boats and they come out now, they finish the party in, they want to leave when the party goes come out by cookery. And they, 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 they basically block one of the two lanes of the Digo Martin uh, Road and cause a jam all the way back to Mubijang. That's called a short-term increase in demand that has caused a situation above, above capacity. But that is, I can certainly be short, you know? And this is short. I, I come to that lesson. Then you have medium term. The medium term is basically based on just the, the overall situation of demand and supply. And um, our daily commute, which is in congestion even, I mean, not the same the kind we had today. Today just expands on it. But even the normal daily commute that we get, where we do get congestion, where we do get significant delays and very short travel, very long travel time, is, 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 is really that medium, what I call medium term disequilibrium. There is a disequilibrium, we we'll talk about it. And then there are long-term imbalances, which are really based on where, how land use is organized, where our activity travelers are derived demand, and it depends on where our activities are, where's home, where's school, where's work, and how do we move in between those things? That is what our long-term situation is. Uh, but as I said, the classification I'm using is really more one of um, degree rather than kindness, so that sometimes you have a mix of all things. So let's talk about short-term to begin with. 
Um, in terms of short term, all right, in terms of short term congestion alleviation, it requires trans what you call comprehensive transportation systems management. That is really what what some people call it some is traffic management, but really we, we recognize that it's a bit more than just traffic management. It's really the management of the transportation system, and it should be comprehensive. And you see, there are some there are some fundamentals that are that must be put in place for comprehensive transportation systems management. You have to have a priority of usage of your existing facilities. It must be consistent with some overarching transportation policy. You must consider those that are most vulnerable, both in terms of the areas, because there are some environmental issues, and in terms of the persons. We must try to get as efficient movement of vehicles as possible. There's nothing wrong with trying to get efficient movement of vehicles, but constrained by the need to protect vulnerable persons and areas. And of course, you need to control things like parking, you need to be able to encourage and enhance active transportation that is non-motorized walking, cycling. You need to be continuously collecting up-to-date, real-time traffic data so that you can manage the system on a real-time basis. You need decisions which are driven by proper traffic engineering analysis. And of course, the traffic control devices must be properly designed and functioning, and the traffic regulations must be part of sustaining that. And we need, of course, our education, our enforcement, and all those things that go hand in hand. So it's a, it's a, it's a, basically, it's a management part. Transportation systems management is like any other kind of process management. If you think about it, it is just that, that, that applied to the, to the transportation system, right? So what's missing for us in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, let's start with the fact that we don't have an adequately staffed and resourced transportation systems management organization. I, um, as the prof said that I was a former chief traffic engineer. That was when Adam was a boy in short pass. I left there in 1988. I would argue that between 1988 and now, the branch, which is still a branch, and if you understand how ministries are organized, you have the permanent secretary, then you have the divisions, <laughs> and you have the branch. <laughs> so we have a traffic management branch. <laughs> hmm? Yes. After 32, no, it started in 1978. So how many years is that? Look at calculation. It is still a traffic management branch. Before I left in 1988, yes, thank you. <laughs> Before I left in 88, I remember designing an organization for a division of traffic and transportation to take its place in management of the transportation sector in Trinidad. I went and discussed with ONM at that, that, in those days at the the whole HR was being done, the organization and management department, et cetera, et cetera. Anyhow, we still have a traffic management branch. We need a functional transportation policy. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. We need this. So what is missing? All these are missing. We don't have a functional transport policy. We don't have an adequately staff and resource organization. We do not have systematic collection of traffic data in terms of some fundamental traffic characteristics, including accident black spot analysis. We do not have proper design and use of the traffic control systems. We still have traffic signs up here that, that were deemed no longer legal way back in 1990-something. And it still exists. We do not have adequate regulations, and we certainly do not have, we have poor enforcement. And we certainly do not have adequate parking control. We are told that the car control parking unless you can take the driver. What nonsense. So if you park your car in the wrong place and you just do whatever, Turn up. The car can just remain here. Let me continue. So I want to give this as an example of what I consider to be uninformed action. Uninformed action. Remember, we had some Facebook things about accidents at the intersection of Mokoya Avenue and PBR. I don't know how the Buddha would make a book. 
I remember going to, to have a look at it. I was asked. I wouldn't say what. And I so I and I recognize what, what happened. There are the side triangles are non-existent. When you are on Mokoya Avenue North, you do not see vehicles on the Brati bus route coming from the east until you are practically in the intersection. In fact, you don't see one of the signals. You don't see the secondary signal. You don't see the primary signal. You only see the second. So it is very easy to miss the signal and come into the bus route. And here's the problem. When you are coming on the bus route from the east, you do not see vehicles on the north. So the side triangles are bad. And because the side triangles are bad, it means that if something happens, if someone makes, you see, one of the things that I'm going to talk about was safety, if you got a time, because I know we have limited time, because ask these guys, I can be here until 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> but one of the issues in terms of safe systems, which, and we need a safe systems approach with safety, is that you have to have forgiven infrastructure. Your infrastructure must be such that if persons make a mistake, it is not catastrophic. So if that person coming from the north of Mokoya Avenue makes a mistake and creeps into the intersection on his red, the driver who's coming on the priority bus route has precious seconds to avoid a collision. And when I look the Facebook videos that I saw, I mean, and, and by the way, Facebook videos is not a basis for, for, for applying traffic in, traffic uh, um, mitigation, I come to that just now. It suggested to me that that was at least the case in some of the accidents I saw. Anyhow, so the pause that we found it wise to put what it considered be rumble strips on the priority bus. So the problem is rumble strips, which is really bigger, a zog in the road. And this was the one, the wrong street, they put on Mokoya Avenue. I don't know, I, I, I could, I thought it was maybe, I didn't know what it was when I saw it, to be honest. <laughs> and I was told, oh, that's the wrong street, put the Mokoya Avenue in the section. I said, okay. okay. So, <laughs> let's, let's continue before I get into trouble. So this is a video I took, sorry for the slow-mo. And this is what the wrong strips have caused. You understand what those vehicles are doing? Well, they they are actually going, as they approach an intersection, which is already indicated as a problem, all of the, the, these vehicles are going onto the other lane of this two-lane road, rather than over the road. Yeah. yeah. So this is what we have encouraged. This is what we have created. And, um, you know, I said, well, this is terrible behavior. And um, these maxi taxis should be condemned. You know? But then when I continued to, to photograph, I realized that ambulances felt that that was necessary as well. I guess they didn't want to rough. <laughs> it's, it's rough <laughs> and then there are those who said, you know what? Rumble strip or no rumble strip, I go into same speed because I have a big SUV. And if you check and see how many accidents on the priority bus route to that intersection were basically big SUVs. I, I want someone to also check to see if they were authorized priority bus route users, but nobody seems to care. So I said, well, maybe that's only from the Eastern side. You know what I mean? So let's see what happens on the next side. So I went, I went and I took this video on the, on the other side. Now this lane here is actually a, a, an acceleration lane as you just leave the arm. So all these vehicles are actually in the wrong lane, right? So what has happened, and let me just run it off because I know I could spend the whole time here. I was, I spent a good a couple of hours and I was very, oh, there you go. I was very upset. In case you think that PTSD bus drivers are anyway immune, immune to not wanting to rumble their passengers, although these buses are very comfortable. This bus is actually heading west in the East Bong Lane as it approaches the traffic signal. So here's what has happened with this. Because we have not analyzed the situation and we have implemented something which may seem to be a good idea to somebody, what we have created is a much more hazardous condition. An accident begging, I can't even say accident waiting to happen. 
an accident begging to happen. So you can imagine, because many of these accidents occur, I suspect they are unauthorized party bus route users, and they are in the evenings. So you can imagine all of these unauthorized party bus route users coming on the bus route on an evening again, unauthorized, and of course, not wanting to rumble, will be taking the right side lane where you already have a problem with the side triangle, getting them to have even less reaction time if some hapless person happens, of course. And it could be a pedestrian right there because there are no pedestrian signals at that traffic signal. Although there are scores of children who use that because there are schools. So let's look at me. So medium term congestion. Medium term congestion, because this is what this is what we are living in all of. And, and you see, we need a major shift in mode for a major corridor traffic to, to alleviate medium term congestion. We cannot build our way out of congestion. Many countries have tried, all have failed. And I don't understand why we are trying to show that we could fail better than them. But this is what we appear to be doing. And we should understand that public transport cannot be for only poor people. When I was running PTSC, I had a big argument with the union about that. I said, that is a death knell for us. Because if public transport is for only poor people, then you have a problem. All right. That's when we introduced the express commuter service to show that public transport was not only for poor people. And a lot of people had doubts that people who were not poor people would take it, but they know what? They did. They did once they believed the service was good quality and reliable and had information on the service because we had grades published, we had schedules published, we had all those other Anyway, let's move on. We did a study on ECS corridor recently found that basically in terms of ECS corridor, modal split, 60% private car and 40% public transport users. But as a main mode, but when we break that further down into High occupancy vehicles versus sedan type vehicles, 80% is sedan type, and only 20% high occupancy vehicle types. And we need to make a shift in that if we are going to deal with that disequilibrium on the existing road network between demand and supply for vehicles. And we, you know, we have to prioritize public transport in terms of capital expenses, transfers, and subsidies and fiscal incentives. So my colleague <laughs> likes to show this picture. He said, pictures with a thousand words. I don't have to say anything about that. But basically, everywhere around the world is that there's a major motor shift. You want to get greener transport? Forget electric vehicles. Put the emphasis on major motor shift. You want to have a motor shift to electric buses or electric max stack? I'm going to come back to electric buses just now. If maxi taxi is carrying, let's say, eight times the amount of passengers that buses are carrying, if you want to get green transport, what should you have electric? I know, I know. That's a tough, that, that's, that's, that's a, I'm going to ask that question, but next time I set exams, so let me see this and see if they get it right. Anyhow, let me move on. We need a mass transit system. We need a mass transit system in Trinidad. And just because we don't have rapid rail, doesn't mean we shouldn't have a mass transit system. And this is some talk I gave in 20, oh boy, maybe 2016 or so, 2015. I said, no rapid rail does not mean no. And in fact, I was speaking at that, at that time as a member of Apex Transportation Committee. So I can, I can put Apex name in that because uh, the exec council did agree. They didn't know what trouble it caused, but they did agree. <laughs> now, in, in its wisdom, the government asked the IDB to look at that whole thing again in 2017. And lo and behold, and we didn't, they didn't come to me, they didn't come to Dr. Fuller, I don't think they spoke to any of us. But guess what? They came up with the same thing that we were telling the government in 2005. 
before they spent $500 million on the planning for a rapid rail system. But we told them before they signed a single contract, that would not be a feasible option for this country of 1.4 million people on this 2,000 square miles of screen. But I guess we are just local experts. Who are, what, what did someone say? Sour grapes. Because we wanted to share in the 500 million. Let me explain something. I have colleagues from Northwestern University who are not professors in all over the world. And when I talked to them about what we were trying to do in Philadelphia, they could not understand the madness. When I told them that we spent over 10 million, almost 10 million US dollars, is that right? I don't know, a lie. Almost 100 million US dollars on the planning for a rapid rail system, which when the designers came to Trinidad and said, this is what we are going to do. I was, I was not, I was in TTM media as the vice president of the transport committee, uh, sorry, as the president of the transport committee. And he made a presentation and the young man, I felt sorry for him, I didn't feel too sorry because he being well paid. He said, we're gonna have 100 car, 100 persons per car trains. I said, great. He said, we're gonna have five cars per train. I said, great. He said, we're gonna have frequencies of one train every 12 minutes and we're gonna have five stops between Arima and Boston. And I said, three questions. First question is that you're missing a zero somewhere. And he looked at me as if I was going mad. I said, because, I just have a little envelope. I didn't really walk with a calculator. Well, as an engineer, you walk with a slide rule. I'm a good school, school engineer. I said, but if you have one train every 10 minutes, yeah, you calculated it now. You can do the math, you know. Let's say it's five trains per hour by 500 persons per train. What's the number? 2,500, right? You're going to put it up. Multi billion dollar train system to move 2,500 persons per hour. And rail systems don't even begin to make sense under 30 and 40,000 persons per hour. What did, it, what did, what did, what did IDB say? That the best alternative for the East West Corridor is bus rapid transit on a priority bus route. We told them that since 2005. <laughs> All right. And in terms of north south, express bus, large max taxis on dedicated HOV lanes. Okay. Now, mass transit systems, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because you know, mass transit systems can include all sorts of things rapid rail, but also BRT, guided buses, city buses, all can be systematized. All right. These are just some of the numbers in terms of what capacity of various systems are. And you see BRT is right up there in the 45,000 passengers per hour per direction, well able to accommodate our demands in Trinidad, which is looking for. Um, this is a study from, from Japan, which basically showed that the bus systems are quite good at organizing the, and at a much lower cost than like real, even at. 20 and 25,000 passengers per hour. All right, moving on. So what determines the best alternative? We need proper analysis of travel demand patterns. So then your choice of vehicle type, size, and technology will be based on cost effectiveness and operating policies based on national transport policy objectives. So if you don't want to raise the blood pressure of this old man, don't come back and talk about the fact that if we had a real system, we wouldn't have congestion. I will show you some pictures of countries that have rail systems that are running practically empty with congestion on the roof. But that's another story for another day. Yeah, I yeah, bring my bad boy. <laughs> if I look at bad. Anyway, let me just country very quickly what the IDB said about our corridors. And just look at some of the numbers in terms of passengers over the D and that kind of stuff. Um, Western corridor, Eastern corridor, Southern corridor, etc. Okay. Okay, I can pass. So we know what the max tax is carrying over 80% of the public transport trips already. I did figure that out. 42% of the traffic on the 
party buses is not public transport operators. Well, they, they, they were kind of projected on the basis of what State ABs did in 2008. We did some work on it in 2019 at UV with some students, and our figure is now 50%. 50% of vehicles on the party bus route are not public transport vehicles at all. Now, when I was at PTSC, we did a little estimate of how many more trips we could make, how many more passengers we could carry, even with our limited number of buses, if we did not have private cars on the bus. And we can increase our passengers. I'm, I'm, I'm rebut a port of Spain in terms of passengers carrying by over 40%. And that was way back, as I said, when Adam had a short pass. So that imagine that we have congestion on the priority bus route caused mainly by private cars. I was part of the team that designed the priority bus from San Water Port of the, the town of Puna. We didn't go as far as McCoy, so don't blame me for the McCoy. And we designed it for 600 buses per hour as the capacity. Not for 1,500 mainly private cars per hour. So they should change it from priority bus route to priority big boy route. Because having a priority bus route pass is part of your privilege as an esteemed member of our society. So part of your privilege as an esteemed member of society is that public transport users, i.e. the public, must suffer in congestion on the priority bus route. And then you ask yourself why. At any time, a little bit of rainfall, a little flood happens, the first decision is to put private cars on the priority bus. Utter nonsense. Cars don't drown. Cars don't die. If you want to get people out of Port of Spain, tell them, go to the priority bus, go to the terminals, come on their buses into Port of Spain, ask the Maxi Taxi, so come on their Maxi Taxi in the Port of Spain, get the people out. Come back for the cars later on, many dangerous cars. Perhaps that is, but I, but I made a suggestion of four. <laughs> right, I'm not being academic. <laughs> I'm in the University of Chattanooga, so I guess he didn't understand. He meant it as an insult, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm being academic. I had to explain to him that I walked the train line before it was a bus route. But I designed it as a bus route as, as part of the team on the MTRS for saying rest his soul and Norman Pierre rest his soul. In the days when the Ministry of Books said we were designed in house in the road spanning branch. Risk my name, who those days? They had some legendary guys and expertise there to do that. And that's who we learned on them. But I ran buses on the bus route as a, as, a, as, a, as a CEO of the PTS. So don't tell me about academic as an insult. But anyway, I digress. Sorry. You know, you know this, this hurts still hurt enough. They don't hurt at all. I don't really care. Why does it matter how big is this? We must understand that proper analysis and data analysis and design is important. And don't let anybody make us feel as if that's not important. So they think that that's the best way to do it. I heard from somebody we don't need to do economic analysis of public infrastructure services because it is public infrastructure. It just has to be done. Say so what? Tell that to the World Bank and the IDB and the, any other banking institution. If you do not show economic evaluation that this is a valuable net present value project, why are you doing it? If your net social value is negative, why are you doing it? If you cannot justify it on the basis of the society, because the society is paying for it. Anyhow, I digress. I'm, I'm, I'm like to digress. But in the total peak of public transport passenger trips per direction is less than 10,000. Easily accommodated on a BRT. Anyhow, let me move on. So I don't want to sell you, but basically, IDB said the BRT is better than anything else on, a, on almost all criteria. And I'm just going to. But what is BRT? A, a, a bus rapid transit system which has infrastructure based on a center lane carriageway so you could board from both sides, exclusive right away to have one of those already, priority or grade separating the changes. We can create priority interchanges in at grade by simple technology, which has been existing for the last 40 years, but we don't have it. And better yet, what about grade separating those interchanges? We suggested, and I say we, this will be a, 
I think I can I can call up any names because it is we did a proposal where we suggested that one of the key priorities should be great separating of the intersections and the party bus route. I would certainly put that ahead of the interchange in Nico Martin because the interchange in Nico Martin will be a parking lot. The first day there's any big rain in Kokori because it, at right now they still have a problem where because of a block outflow, it goes from two lanes to one lane under the St. James flyover. But we go from three lanes to two lanes by the hospital. And then guess what? As happened this afternoon, where the big interchange was a parking lot, the new interchange will be a parking lot. Oh, it doesn't happen to the Cuddy Ribbon. I just hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> it is not that it is not necessary, by the way. Everything is necessary. But we have to ask ourselves what is priority. So, we're going to BRT. Ticket validation and control at the station, not on board. You have to have a smooth movement and access the platform on both sides. So, that is basically some of the BRT attributes. And I would suggest anybody want to understand BRT, just Google Kuritaba. And uh, or just Google BRT system, then you see some beautiful examples of that. But just to close off the discussion from the IDB, BRT is superior in terms of cost, revenue per cost, overall ridership, capture of existing public transport users, interstation distance. Remember, you don't have in five stations. So, how are you get it from one, from one? If you're living here and the station is quite on there, how are you get in there? Land acquisition. Modularity and flexibility, non exclusivity integration of the market taxi system. So you can bring the market taxi system into your tra public transport system and net present value and, and, and buff infrastructure. Is net present value or net social present value one of the key things you want to look at in terms of deciding what uh, infrastructure to develop? Yeah, we must. I, we teach that to our graduate engineers. And they also suggested complementary initiatives, fiscal incentives, um, great separation. Hey, I wanted to copy our document, but great separation of critical costs on the priority bus and park and ride facilities. Public transport management, they copied the document that we did in 1996 when the National Internal Transportation Policy Study under Dr. Fulong indicated that we needed to have a proper organization for public transportation management. Restricting carriers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What's missing? Okay. There is no institution responsible for overall planning, management, regulation, or coordination of the public transport sector. I asked somebody who's in charge of public transport in this country. And they said the Minister of Works and Transport. I say, who under him? He said, the PS. I say, who under her? Because the PS can't be in charge on a detainee basis. And the answer is nobody, no organization, no agents. So if there's no institution there that is planning, managing, and regulating, or even getting information, then how can we start to organize it? There's no policy, strategy, or plan that governs the direction and operation of the sector. We have it in Vision 2030, and it will be this way. But that's not a plan, that's a vision. You need a plan to get to the end of the vision. What's missing? We don't have the organization. Simple as that. We have not created the institution because we have not seen it fit to create the institution. Because we create institutions when we see it fit so to do as a country. And I'm not bashing this government. We have been crying for this since 1996. So you can blame whoever you want to be. <laughs> Sit some water. <laughs> What's missing? What about fiscal incentives of public transport users as opposed to the state owned public transport operators? In what birth some innovations like the express commuter service and the rural and the school transport system, which, by the way, is functioning? People don't even understand its function. I don't think PTSC understands how, how, it how it's supposed to function. Because when the operators couldn't get paid, they said, talk to the ministry. PTSC was set up as the agent of the ministry to contract maxi taxes, 
to operate services at PTSC in its analysis. Because in those days, PTSC used to analyze its cost structure. Found that the cost per passenger in those routes was more than it, it than they could hire a maxi taxi to operate. So that's how the maxi taxi to operate. Let the ministry pay for that, fine, they get the service and we can do what we have to do. Budgetary allocations that are less auto-centric and more public transit friendly. How much of the budget has been allocated to improvement of the facilities for public transport users of the bulk of the public transport system? I haven't seen it. Infrastructure to improve the travel experience. Unless you improve the travel experience of existing public transport users, you're not gonna get auto users shifting. The best advertisement is word of mouth from somebody who is satisfied. I mean, nothing. When I finish this talk, I hope everybody says, well, it's so obvious because it's not, it's not rocket science. But you have to actually want to make those shifts. Public transport management, that's missing. Rapid implementation of these changes that have been recommended for decades. Let's talk about long-term <laughs> congestion alleviation. Woo. So let's talk about land use transportation planning. Travel is a derived demand. It's based on how we organize our land use and the spatial separation that's what creates travel. I was telling Prof that I could have done this from home and then we could have started at five, but I wouldn't have the pleasant company I have here this evening. <laughs> I would have a chance to see him. I was happy I'm here. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying in terms of travel is the right demand. I had to be here, so therefore I have to travel. And you have to go to work. And for most of us going to work, I don't know what tell you work and listen. If you have a run a factory, tell you work is what I'm talking about. If you have factory work, what is tell you work about? If you are service industry worker, you have service in the public, what, what are you talking about? There are some jobs that you can do tell you work. But not that many, and not in an economy that is structured like ours. So, and the most regular and highest value travel is a daily commute from home to work and school. And not to make it um, tele, tele school, you know what that has worked on. All around the world, at all levels, including at the university level. We're seeing it in failure rates at all levels, including the university level. Get into that too much. I want to talk about the school. Demands for the, the, for the child petition system are intrinsically bound with decisions we make about where we work or where we go to school and, and, and where we live. And, and in societies such as ours, where we live is the hardest decision because where we live is, is kind of governed by warehousing because available that we could afford. And then you figure out how to get to work from here. And, and, and what, what school our children goes to is determined by how well they do and what school you want them to go to and you figure out how to get there. Isn't that how we do it? Because you have that choice. You know? And let me don't, don't get that. So what I want to make is this. We need long-term sustainable transportation. We need to have the integration of land use and transportation planning as an approach. That is not, and that is not, that, that is so obvious. The UN has been saying that for years. The UN Commission of Sustainable Development talked about that. They said the first thing in this integrated land use transportation plan, if you don't have sustainable transport, you need to have that integrated. You need to develop clean, efficient, affordable public transport options. You need to consider your access to rural transport and make it affordable. You need to address the mobility needs of special groups and elderly and disabled. You need to facilitate active travel, walking, and non-motorized transport in urban centers. And that would all help to reduce the air pollution and greenhouse gases. You need it. So let's just decide to take actions to do it. So we have an intention of developing a new national transportation plan. That's a good intention. And I look at the budget, I see a half a million dollars has been allocated in 2023. Now, even at the lowest paid local, on, local consultants, it didn't cost half a million dollars. To do a national transportation plan. Don't mind me, they did one in 1996 for free. The 1996 document was done free of charge for the ministry. You should go back and read that document, see who was involved in it, and see what is recommended. 
all the consultants from then have been coming and just taking pieces of that and charging other money. Anyhow, let's continue. The fact of the matter is that that national championship plan is not going to be ready before 2024. And probably it's not going to start to be implemented if it's implemented until 2025 or 2026. <coughs> My question is this Has any analysis been done? You see, because we hear people talking about how we haven't had one since 1967, which is correct. But the follow up question, if any journalist would care to ask, is why? It's not good enough to say we haven't had one. Why have we not had one? Maybe we could ask Mark Bassan to investigate that. <laughs> Just teasing. I know of at least four previous major transportation planning studies, which for one reason or the other were not accepted and therefore not made as government policy. That is what I consider to be acceptance. Government accepts this as policy. I, I, you don't even have to lay it in parliament. Just say that the cabinet has approved it. That's enough for people to start to take action on it. Laying it in parliament is even nicer, right? So I just want to name four that I know. 1984, National Transportation Policy Project done by a consortium of local and foreign firms, NEPA. 1996, that study I talked about, a group of local engineers, planners, and senior technical officers, as well as representatives of various chambers, led by the Ustwile Dockery Fulon, my colleague. 19, 2006, the comprehensive national transportation study done by Parker, Parsons, Rickenhoff, Trail, and Douglas Limited. I call that the secret study because nobody could get a hold of what it was that they studied or even what data they collected. It was like unlocking fourth knots. For us at the university, we're trying to get some data on the traffic flows that they get. We don't have to see what they recommended because in fact, what they recommended wasn't accepted anyway. It was never accepted. And then we had a document that was done in 2010. And this is an interesting document, a framework for implementation of national transportation projects. APDSS of Common Limited did that for NITCO. And while that was the full policy study, it did indicate a framework for determining what investment should be and how to determine investment. And if that was fully, if it was followed, then the billions of dollars that were put at risk, is that a good phrase to use? I don't want to say spent because I don't know. By the way in which what was considered to be the San Fernando Point Forte Highway, which is actually a misnomer, is really I consider it to be the extension of the Solomon Shore Highway. And in fact, my colleague says not even that is is partial of extension and part of continuation of an arterial road system for the southern area. That would never have been done the way it was done and had the problems that it incurred. And the hard part about it is that before the contract was signed, they were advised not to do it that way by this study. After the contract was signed, it didn't make any sense saying, don't do it. The higher root movement wanted to stop it, but it couldn't be stopped because Stopping them would have meant loss of profits for the contract. You would have had no road and same money spent. That's the reality of contracts. Anyhow, let me move on. What's required? And I'm just going to about to close off. I'll even check the time. Administration of the consultancy for that national transportation policy is, is happening. Here's what I suggest. And I suggest this to the chairman of the National Planning Authority. Take that project away from the Ministry of Works and Transport. Why do I say that? I have no problem with the Ministry of Works and Transport. I grew up in the Ministry of Works and Transport. But I can tell you that there is no one in the Ministry of Works and Transport who is capable of even writing the RFP for this project properly. If that person is so capable, let's have a discussion. Because they do not have a transportation planning unit. So if you don't have a transportation planning unit, how can you write an RFP for consultants for a national transportation plan? At least I know the National Planning Authority has on the authority people who understand planning, and in fact, there's a transportation planner on there. And the channel that is a, is a land use planner. 
So at least you have some of that expertise there in the national plan. Put it there in the Ministry of Planning and Development for national transportation. Because what's going to happen with that national transportation policy study? Forget the policy issues. It's going to come up with a number of projects. Mon is that a good phrase? Money bet? <laughs> at least you use it when you're a child, right? You see, money bet has to happen that way. It will happen that way because it has always happened that way. It was happening that way with the LIPA study. It was happening that it happened that way with the um, 1967 study too. Basically, it wasn't any policy. It was rich highways to build when? But if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if you have highway engineers, and I am, I mean, I train highway engineers. I, have, I, am, I love highway engineers. But everything looks as if it's a highway, it's a solution. If you are a surgeon, everything looks as if you're an operate. <laughs> Medical profession. So, you would boldly say this is a national policy study and it should be run by the Planning and Development Ministry. And they, if they need help, they can co op help. They are, there's expertise right here in the country and they have, there's expertise in the region. And I'm going to suggest that if the, as they're doing that, the government should establish a full-time unit of counterpart staff so that they can work alongside, work with, check and make sure they don't do foolishness because guess what? Consultants do foolishness sometimes, especially foreign consultants who know nothing about this country and just come and say, we are the consultants here. With all the respect. With all the respect. And we have to be so careful because they could cost the country $500 million by giving wrong advice. Wrong advice. And the irony of any, don't remember the start of that. That made it like a start of But set up that unit, counterpart stuff. And therefore, you will have people who will be already working in the area of transportation policy development and planning because it's not a one-off thing. You, you don't just put it, have a plan and say, okay, the plan done. No, comprehensive transportation planning requires continuous monitoring, continuous change and continuous development, continuous engagement. And if you do not have the institution set up to do that, well, then it's not gonna go anywhere. So that's, that's what I would advise if anyone cares listen. So what are the key policy issues I want to leave us thinking about? We need to look at mobility of people, not movement of vehicles. This guy once and for all in order. And if that's our thinking, then we would do different things in terms of where we spend our money. What are we investing in? All the monies are being spent. Any investment in active transport? Any investment in making walking and cycling safer? When we did our study of, of the, 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 the travel demand certification score, by, I mean, by a vast majority, what people consider the least safe mode of cycling. No, it's not a shame. It's not a shame that in a country like ours, where I grew up cycling to school, and I'm sure many of us of my age grew up cycling to school. By the time I became a parent, I wouldn't even let my children cycle more around the block. Yes. No, I wouldn't. And now, say what? Do what? Cycle to? <laughs> let's go cycle in the summer. Or let's um, close off a whole section of highways on, on, on a Sunday and they cycle. Yeah. We need to consider the role of the private sector, by the way, in the public transport services. It's already happening. We need to encourage it so the government doesn't have to spend everything. And we need to help to manage and develop that. These guys are the max, If you ever talk to maxi taxi operators, you understand that these guys are entrepreneurs. They spend almost a half a million dollars on their vehicle. They know their business, like any small businessman. They can tell you about their cost of passenger. They can tell you about their situation. Why? Because that's their livelihood. Not with much any help from, from the state government. And therefore, we need to make sure we have sustainable funded services. We cannot have, we, don't, we can't afford prestige projects. We can't afford to be spending $100 a 
to subsidize a water taxi bus. I have no problem with water taxi. I recommend that we look at it. But we should be charging $100, not $15. Instead of saying $15 to the fee and $100 to the subsidy, turn it around. Charge $100 to the trip and $15 subsidy. You say, okay, taking a thousand cars off the road. How many cars come from north or south in an hour? Taking a thousand cars off the road for the day. In the big three hours, we have 4,500 cars per hour. Per hour. Taking a thousand for the day. I rest my case. Folks, I have probably overstayed my work. I want to pause there and um, turn it over to the moderator for the evening. Now we'll have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, so thank you very much for that very thought provoking lecture. Right. Um, so now we invite our attendees either online or in physical presence here at Agora Campus to ask your questions or share your comments. Right. So let's take from our physical audience first. Are there any questions or comments that you all would like to make? Um, you can speak because the mic will pick it up. Hi. Sorry, the Hi. Um, you talked about uh, our priority budget being longest in the world. What happened with that? Why, why is it no longer longest? Because other people have built longer ones. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, but the, the point I was building about that is that we will, at that time, on the forefront. Mm -hmm. Because the priority bus was part of the conception of, of the, the, the lead to the plan study of the East West Corridor in 1973, I believe it was. And um, they were actually, that was actually a, a, a well done study. They looked at whether or not we should go with light rail as opposed to priority bus. So then they looked at it. And in fact, they also, also conceived of the concept of what they consider minibuses, priority one, which is now maxi taxi. And a priority, a priority lane, a priority route that would create a high quality public transport service so that the travel time, and there was a time when if you, the fastest way to get into Port of Spain was on a, 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 when, when you finish a PTSC bus on the priority bus. And that was the intention. The intention was to enhance public transport in such a way that would do two things, cause a, uh, basically cause a shift of mode to public transport, because travel time is one of the key issues inside of there. And, and so that's why I was there. So, but I mean, it's still, it, it's still pretty, it's a good op opportunity to do more for public transport. It exists already. Um, and I want to add to that, a high occupancy vehicle lane um, from, out or not, we could do it, and um, it can make a big difference. I would be radical. I know that um, my colleague had worked on a proposal for using the shoulder. I would be radical and say, you know what? Take one of the three lanes and put us high up on the way. Let's, have, let's, let's, let's analyze that. And, and uh, let's see if that could help to, to create that motor shift. But that just, what a good question. Good question. How do we get the government to buy into some of the recommendations that you've um, proposed us to alleviate some of the problems we face? Um, advocacy. Advocacy. Society has to advocate for what they want. They don't have to accept that things are the way they are and they must remain that. We have been having a, a number of us who are in the profession have continued to advocate. People ask me why I still advocate. As, as you can see, I'm a little passionate about it still. And, and, and that's why we still advocate for it. But we need the general public, who are the ones who are suffering the impacts of it, to, to advocate wherever they are for it. 
you know, and, and it's that advocacy will hopefully get to those who have to make decisions on our behalf. And, and that's, 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 that's part of what we have to do as members of the board. Yes, sir. Um, I was going to ask, uh, if you have any hypothesis into why is it after four um, documents, after doing studies, um, that... Oh, you have a new one coming up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not only that, probably even what is the reason for the rejections or... Oh, oh. Um, I think each one has to be looked at this own merit, but I know a couple of them, what happened? I'll give you a good example of what happened in the 1984 case. See, in the 1984 case, that, that project was actually developed under the highways division. They, that, there's that situation again. However, before the contract was signed, but maybe just after the contract was signed with the government, there was a change in the organization of the government and the government created a Ministry of National Transportation. And the traffic management branch was put out from the highways division because that's where it started, into that Ministry of National Transportation, as was PTSC and some other agencies. And in fact, the management of that contract was put under the Chief Traffic Engineer Traffic Management. And, that was the and the consultants never accepted because you understand what happens to those foreign consultants. They have their relationships and they are also looking for new work. And I know for sure that the foreign consultant had their eye on further projects that they would have had to have a relationship with the highways division. And they fought us and they fought the local joint venture partner every step of the way in that project. And I mean, I, I, I the year it was rejected, I was doing my PhD, so I wasn't here. But, but I know that was part of the problem in that project. 1996 study, um, all I would say is that it did not find favor with the political directory. Some of the things that we were recommending, especially the issue of what we saw then as the looming problem of foreign used vehicles coming into the country. And let me just explain something to people. You see foreign use vehicles? I went to a World Bank study, a World Bank project um, symposium earlier this year. And they were talking about the dumping of foreign use vehicles in developing countries and what a problem it has caused. And I would argue that what we are experiencing now is partly because of the dumping of foreign use vehicles. And that was, that was alluded to in 1996. And that did not find favor with some members of the political directorate at the time. I, I think I'm safe to say that. I'll leave it at that. The, um, hypothesis. <laughs> the CNTS, I have no clue except that there was a major conflict of interest. Because while the consultant was developing the CNTS, which is supposed to inform us as to what is the best policy, they were also hired as a consultant for the rapid rail. Whereas a rapid rail's decision should have come out of the analysis of your policy things. So you have the same consultant doing both tracks. The rest is history. And the, the last one, again, I would say did not find favor with the political director. So whereas we were saying, if you want to do major investments in transportation, this is the systematic way using a multi-criteria analysis profile, et cetera, et cetera, to choose what projects you, but that is not what they wanted to do. They wanted to give a contract for that project out. They wanted to do that project, and therefore they did that project. And the rest, as they say, is history. So, I, I, those are my hypotheses. I'm, sub, I'm subject to anybody who thinks differently or who knows differently correcting me. I, I am not infallible, but I just give you what I remember. And I'm an old man, so I tend to forget things. 
I, I forget names and faces, so protect the innocent as well as the guilty. Yeah, but that's fine. And, and but, but also, sometimes the RFP is badly written, and that is my concern with this current proposal. That is, the people who are writing the RFP don't know what they are doing. They get a badly written RFP that does not really do what it's supposed to do, and therefore it gets rejected. That's right. There we go. You're still taking local, um, you know, because yeah. local. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Right, Ray Fulong. Um, before I ask my question, just to, to, to enlighten the audience on the 96 study, as you talked about the imported used vehicles, foreign used vehicles, the documentation used to come in Japanese as well, the certificate of cancellation. We got it by that document, got it changed to English, but yet they still reject. You are correct in that it was rejected because of the political will at the time. So moving right along, recently, the Ministry of Works announced, and it's on YouTube, they promoted the opening of a 12 kilometer strip from Valencia, the gate there. In fact, it's the first three lane roundabout, if you haven't seen it yet, the first three lane roundabout in Trinidad and Tobago, it's at, at the Valencia Junction. So they opened a 12 kilometer roadway to meet the Toco Main Road, the road to take it to Toco. With continuation to Toko and the premises, it's a two lane road with the improvement of the carriageway and the um, potential landslip location. They built a roundabout to the, as the next story, they built a roundabout to the, to the Wasa plant on the one side and to nothing on the other side. But it was advantageous according to them to build the roundabout now rather than when it was needed. And the premise for that improvement is that the Toko port will be developed by the time it has reached there, the, the improvement has reached there, true. And they keep using the term access improvement, access to schools, access to this, access to that, but primarily Toko port. Now, it is my understanding that the Toko port has not even had environmental approval as yet. Would you say as, your, as a teacher of feasibility studies and engineering development in, in pursuing a project, that that's how you approach project development? You start with the road in the hope that you're going to get the development. Go and say it here. <laughs> Secondly, the next project is the San Fernando Lady Hills Avenue improvement. All these things are being done in house by the government. With, I mean, the designs. I know you talked in a big way about the designs of the ministry in the old days being in house, but they had mentorship. Part of your answer, I would expect you to tell me a little bit about the mentorship in the ministry. No, but more importantly, in the feasibility of project. How do you start a project, the Lady Hills Avenue? The intention is the waterfront development. But I ain't see the waterfront development yet. But the road is the first project towards the waterfront. How does that work in the teaching of justification of engineering projects? Over to you. <laughs> My colleague likes a particular <laughs> interesting position. That's all right. Um, I'm accustomed to really putting me in the difficulty. He had me having to answer some hard questions of a judge in San Fernando when he was a traffic engineer down there. He did something that the judge didn't like. <laughs> if you remember those days. <laughs> um, here's the point I want to make about well, actually the two examples you gave comes back to the point that we made in 2010. In that, what is the approach to determining? prioritization of projects in terms of the spend? What is the technique that is being used to determine the size of the project and the timing of the project? Is there a process that is based on some sort of um, analysis for that to take place? And is there, in, in both those situations you talk about, suggest that there is need for an integration between the land use planning and the transportation plan. 
And therefore, it, it seems as if in both those cases, that hasn't been done. Now, from a time from a timing perspective, as you know, the lifetime, the, 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 the life cycle time of some of these projects is 20 years, as the case may be, and, and can determine what happens then. But as you decide, when you have limited resources, you have to decide what comes first for, because of those resources. You cannot do everything at the same time. And that is why the multi-criteria analysis is important. So that maybe sometimes you should not do something as yet and do something else. Generally, in my opinion, and I come back to my, my bugbear, too much of our infrastructure development is auto-centric to begin with. I'm not even hearing anybody talking about great separation of the priority bus within the section. Right? So, so we have a lot of projects taking place that are all auto-centric. So to come back to your question, I don't know if the integrated land use transportation planning has taken place in those areas. I suspect not because I, I'm not seeing anywhere where it's, it is being considered in that way. And I'm certainly not sure if there is a process as had been designed by the work that we did in 2010 for a multi-criteria, because that's what I would teach my students. I would teach my students, in fact, we do teach them that in final year. As you come into a project, in their final year design project, they must understand how to do multi-criteria analysis to evaluate engineering projects. And all of those projects you talk about, the, the, the Toko situation or the Lady situation, fall right into this. And part of those criteria would be access and, and access as defined. You have to define what access means. All right, it's access, and, and you could find access in a couple of different ways, but you have to define it and quantify it to determine how your projects go and which projects to do things. So I think that is what is that is you see, that I think is what is missing from the equation that would answer this question. And, and I don't get the impression, even when I look at I come back to the Diego Martin Interchange. There's nothing wrong with having a Diego Martin Interchange. But I cannot see how that could be a priority over my pet projects, great separation of the priority bus route, over creating a high occupancy vehicle lane for the north south traffic, over so many other different types of public transport infrastructure that could improve the traveling experience and cause that modal shift and cause that greener transport to take place. So, you know, it's, 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 part, it's part of the same issue that I have with how we approach that in the context of, of what we build, when we build it, and how we fund it, and how we justify what we are doing. And I am not, I am not clear that that analysis is being done. I am not, no one has come to argue with me. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to, to to, to hear someone say that they're doing that analysis and they have done that analysis and these are the results. In fact, I would ask them to do a seminar for after it because I think it's a learning experience because we teach our young engineers that even at the undergrad final year, you have to show the feasibility of your project. You remember those days? Uh, yeah, but I, I want to have an experience, a real life experience with that where I was working for a public organization and I realized that their projects, they don't use this multi-criteria analysis. And I brought that to the forefront and even uh, the small tutorial about it made a nice little spreadsheet template that we could use. And um, it's exactly what you described. They want a certain project first and then they will try to manipulate the, the, numbers. the numbers and it came to a point where they didn't use the analysis anymore. And then they kind of blocked me from being part of those uh, types of decision-making. And, and it's not a shame of us that our young engineers, we are teaching them the right thing to do. And that is why it's important that we have organizations and we support organizations like APEC in terms of, of advocacy for these things. We are teaching them the right thing to do. But others in the decision making area are teaching them the experience thing too. And the last part, the mentorship part, and the role of mentorship well, within the ministry. Well, but you see, but that is that, that, 
that that is negative mentorship that you experience there because you, <laughs> you know, that is that, that is frightening mentorship, but that, that is all too common some in some areas. So that I don't know. I, when I was in the ministry, as I said before, um, and I talk about MTS or sign and no one here. And their position was engineers need to make engineering decisions. Right? Maybe you'll handle the, the follow-up. But you as a young engineer, make your engineering decisions. And I tell my students the same thing too. You as an engineer have to tell them what is, and, and you, in a way you, you don't have the power to, to, at the time to override what those are doing, but you have to, you must know in your own mind, yeah. right from wrong. And you must make sure and look for mentors who are, who appropriately understand that. As I said, I, I can't speak to the, the, the engineers in the, in the various agencies, but I don't, I don't work with them. I don't work under them. So I cannot say what they do. But I would hope that as members of this profession, I would first hope that they are all registered engineers. And if they are registered engineers, there are certain ethical responsibilities that registered engineers have. And that they, are, they hold themselves to those ethical responsibilities. I can only hope that in, in terms of working. Okay, I'd like to take some questions from YouTube very quickly before we wrap up. Okay, so Mr. Lee Leon asks, how effective is the improvement on the quality of the road infrastructure in pavement condition in the whole idea of congestion reduction solutions? What is Dr. Leon answering? <laughs> how effective is the improvement on the quality of the road infrastructure? Okay. I, if, 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 if what Dr. Leon is asking is, if you have bad infrastructure where that cause congestion, yeah. sure, and the answer is yes. If, if, your, road, if your road infrastructure is, is, is bad, then of course the capacity of that roadway is, is going to be reduced, right? So, so whereas you know, we have capacity on the basis of, of the width and the gradient and so the road, the road surface quality also affects capacity, right? Okay. And certainly a, 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 a wasa pothole, if I want to call it that way, with all due respect, could, could, could lower your capacity from 700 vehicles per hour to 200 vehicles per hour. Of course, about that. Yeah. Right. Also from Mr. Greenwich, he asks, with the driving culture in TNT, will, will an HOV lane be effective? It will be as effective as it is, as it is in enforced, you know? And there are ways in which you can, you can enforce the enforcement. You can, you can support the enforcement by, by physical means as well. Let me give you, okay, I don't have to give you that example, but yes, you, you can, in fact, if you think about what is required, you can create it and get it done. I, I, there's no reason why it can't be done. Okay, so on this note, let us wrap up this questions and answers session for today. Thank you all for your stimulating discussion. At this time, I invite Professor Winston Sweet to the lectern to say the closing remarks. Distinguished lecturer. Yes, I did. <laughs> I would like to start with some words of thanking the guest lecturer for his, his presentation. One, as well as his answers to the questions provided both by the in-house or in-person staff, as well as those away from the group. And as I sat there, I, I, I asked myself, what is? And um, one of the things that I would like to come out of these discussions, particularly this one, 
is the role of the two teaching institutions, UWI, Teaching and Research, and UTG, or the one and the professional body, APET. In other words, I am hoping that that symbiosis, that linkage between these three organizations will provide, in a sense, a missing link that Dr. Thompson has suggested, in a sense. The professional body has to make a greater contribution. Practicing engineers, whether they are in the public service or the private sector, or academics. We have to be ready for a greater contribution. In other words, we are talking about more than one person mentioned the question of implied about government and as if this is a government. What did this government change? And yet we have the problems. And until we recognize the, those three bodies I linked, you, UTG, and APET in particular, recognize the role and function of the person in providing that analysis, the objectivity, the critical review that's needed, in a sense that no matter who constitutes the government, that they will have to listen to the profession and to the academics. And until the professionals and the profession body and the academic institutions recognize their role, their role to be vigilant, to be critical. In a sense, what we will be doing is hoping for some magic answer to come from the sky. So much for the role of those who, and, and I, I did not mention the other organization, the one that deals with registration. APET, way back to 1970, 50 something, started to raise the discussion about what is a professional engineer. And we had the older engineers putting on the agenda the question of training and the relationship between the professional bodies and the academic bodies, that relationship. You know, it was the vigilance of the practicing profession, monitoring what is done in teaching and research. That has to intensify. This exercise of these uh, invited lecturers, and we're going to continue on here. Some of you all might realize that Dr. Azad Mohamed is, is not by accident the other invited person to follow. Because, in a sense, whether we are talking about transportation or we are talking about whatever area, school education, we have to look at the question of physical planning. Physical planning as it impacts on the education system, the health system, transportation, so you name it. And it is, now I said, not accidental, coincidental why Azad is supposed to be next person following up. And what we will try to do, possibly early in the, in the new academic year, is to set up a panel discussion. So we will continue to have single guest lectures to provoke and take us forward. But we need to have a forum of these people coming from the different sectors of the profession and the different segments 
debating, the debate, keeping these institutions, you know, those, my friend there raised this woman who uh, young lady raised the question, question, how do you make sure that policy and institutions that come remain on the straight and narrow path, academic, intellectual, he mentioned somebody dismissing him as being academic. Being an academic is not a sin. In fact, it should be, it should be a honor. honor. And I want to stop here and I want to go to another place. I tried a couple of years ago to, to, to seduce this gentleman to language. <laughs> <laughs> to come. I knew I was going to say this. <laughs> I tried my best to seduce, to entice <laughs> this gentleman to come and enhance your duty. And, um, I tried my best. <laughs> I almost thought I had him. <laughs> as one of the persons that I was recruiting to get, get into. I tried to number other people who came as part-time lecturers. One is here, another one left, to enhance this institution. And not only that, the other thing I'm committed to is to make sure that those three institutions that I talked about are kept before the Red New Fine. Four for the time. That we will work together. This, this guest lecture forum and the panel discussion will be together. And not one organization going off by itself. So it is not research or teaching or none of these things going on by ourselves. We are in this business about the development of this country together, all of us. I tried to get him, and when I thought I had him, you we really enticed him, and he did not come. I felt defeated. Betrayed. <laughs> 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 I never gave him. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to say that what we got here today is, is more than a treat. It's a tour de force. It's, it is excellence. And my friend didn't have to look at this. He could have spoken extempore as they say. <laughs> because this is what he has spent his life doing. This is what he has spent his life bridging that gap between research, industry, the professional body, and academia. He's one of the best of us. He is one of the best that you all are, and those who are listening outside, you are lucky to have had his presentation. You're going to continue to do that. And we are going to continue to lead on him. And I'm hoping that he too will be in that panel discussion to discuss the question of uh, the built environment, the environmental question, environmental management. That is, that is what I'm going to say up to now. But I want to do more. I want to ask Trevor, how is he going to make sure that what he did here today is somehow the other preserved in the thoughts of the younger generation. In other words, that document, you, 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 have to, you have to get a series of these documents, but particularly your, your, present, your presentation here today as a gift to you. And the UTG, a gift that they will never forget what you presented yesterday. 
that they will never, and coincidentally, I was coming on here and we were talking, me and uh, my friend, and we were saying, how coincidental that he's coming to talk to us about a topic that is trapping all of us. Oh dear, bringing it home to us. Trevor, I am going to say on behalf of you, TT and me, that what you have done for us today is made a, a invaluable contribution to that discourse that we are asking that now you are the president of the association, that you will assist in strengthening the tie between the institutions. Right? I am asking you to commit to that exercise. You are a gem. And you will be called upon even to provide the community of engineers in Kitty with a short lecture series, possibly about four or five lectures on transportation. Will you undertake? <laughs> I mean, Done. I want to see. Done. I want to see. When you and I are no longer here. <laughs> Something else. I, I, felt, I felt good sitting there listening to you when I said to myself, remember when no one is trying to move? <laughs> it's time for come, come, yeah. come back in. Go back in. It's time for us to think about the future. Yes. Right. Right. So uh, I want to thank Shabal for, for all of us and for the two institutions so far. And what is still coming to do. Thank you very much on behalf of you, UTT, Apex, and the board. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Professor Sweet. Thank you very much, Professor Sweet. At this time, we would like to give a token of appreciation to our speaker. So I invite Ms. Aileen Rambasad Archie to present to Dr. Townsend. Dr. Townsend, and I would like to endorse everything that Professor Sweet just said, and we'd like to thank you for your time and the knowledge you shared with us this afternoon. And please accept our small token of Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Kind words. And um, I will just, before I I'm take a video, say that um, we are, in fact, right now, we have created a committee of planning a technical conference. APET partnering with UTT and UE to do, to, to, and to showcase and the, well, and the board of engineering will be chick and jaw, we have the board that we are with, to showcase the research and innovation of the local engineers. And we are going to be inviting all the organizations involved in engineering to come on board so we can showcase some of the work we are doing and show good engineering practice. So that we are, we are chick and jaw on that. I am promising about any courses, but the technical conference is going to be on the way. Thank you very much, Professor, for those kind. Thank you. Okay, so lastly, I invite Mrs. Trevine John, Ms. Trevine John, to the lecture to deliver the photo camps, which will be the last item on today's program. Good night, everyone. Hi. On behalf of the Project Management and Civil Infrastructure Systems Unit of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, we would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Tongzen for a very informative, engaging, and enlightening presentation. Thank you, Dr. Tongzen, for taking the time to share with us today on the issues impacting congestion reduction in Trinidad and Tobago from your extensive wealth of knowledge and experience. It was indeed a privilege. Thank you as well to all the other departments, such as corporate communications, outreach, and industry relations, IT and TLIS, 
that assisted us with the coordination of this event. We would also like to thank all the participants for attending. Our next lecture will be held on the 20th of June entitled Reforming the Development Regulatory Process in Trinidad. It will be presented by Dr. Asad Mohammed, retired UE lecturer and Lani Splano. Thank you again and see you at our next